Hello, friends. Welcome to the ATC Double Cut. My name is Michael Woods, and I am the chief scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. In this episode, I'm going to share some flights and favorite turf photos of 2023. I'm going to go over that blog post that I wrote at the end of 2023. It's something that I've been doing for a few years, looking back over the photos that I took over the course of the year and seeing what I learned from that or what uh, type of things I remembered about the turf grass that I saw around the world because these are all turf grass photos of some sort. So I start off by looking at a map. I will put a direct link to this and I encourage you to go check out this blog post so you can have a look at these photos, which uh, I think... They're, they're not only educational for me or um, reminding me of things that are useful for turf grass management, but you may find them also to be pretty pictures and you may find them to be um, uh, educational in some way. So I'm going to try to describe because I know a lot of people are listening to this as a podcast. So I'm going to describe for these pictures what I learned and uh, I will put a direct link to this particular blog post in the show notes. The title is Flights and Favorite Turf Photos of 2023. And I started off by showing a map of where I flew by airplane in 2023. And I showed that I went to Europe, to the United States. Well, I'll just go by continent. Uh, Europe, North America, Asia, and Australia. So those are the continents I went to. In total, it was 76 flights, and it was 228,000 kilometers or 142,000 miles. And that's a lot of flights for me. Sometimes I've done a little bit more. Sometimes I've done less. The main thing, though, is... I am so lucky to get a chance to travel around the world because that is almost all business travel and that is almost all going to meet with turf managers or going to visit turf grass sites. So what I get a chance to do is see turf grass and learn about turf grass and how it's managed all around the world. And I can try to draw some common threads between what works and what doesn't work, because if you see something that works near the equator and you see it working at 60 degrees north latitude and you see it working at 30 degrees south latitude and you see it working at 45 degrees north latitude, when you see something that just works with different grass species and in different climates, then you realize that maybe that something has some potential. So I suppose a lot of the things that are involved in what I call the grammar of greenkeeping. You can get that book uh, at the link that I'll put in the show notes also. I, th I know a lot of people already have that book, but that is a very short book that describes many of the principles that are related to what I talk about, about growing the grass at the right rate, making sure it's supplied with enough nutrients, managing the irrigation water, and uh, keeping salinity under control and, and so on. So speaking of salinity, we can pop to the first picture and I show a sunrise from an island in the Andaman Sea, which is in the Indian Ocean off the west coast of Thailand. And there are two grass species growing there. What do I learn from this? Uh, well, these species are tropical beach grass. This is a grass that I learned the name of the common name of for the first time in 2023. I've always known it by the scientific name, Thuaria involuta, and I never quite bothered to look up what the common name of that grass was. And it turns out it's a very apt name, which is tropical beach grass. And it's mixed together with a little bit of manila grass, Zoysia matrella. And that's growing on a sandy beach. And it's... Uh, this is something that's not terribly new to me, uh, but if we start talking about species selection, you rarely find seashore paspalum in this type of sandy, dry beach area. You don't often find 
manila grass either, but in this case, it's at a resort and it will be getting a bit of splash from guests and it's near one of the showers for rinsing off. Uh, so it's getting a little bit of what we could call irrigation. So I think that's why the zoysia, the, the manila grass can survive there. And then the tropical beach grass is typical to see in this kind of area. We don't typically see seashore paspalum in this kind of area. Um, and a lot of people would just think that if you're near the ocean in a tropical area, that seashore paspalum might be a good grass to use. But seashore paspalum tends to require constant uh, supply of water. So uh, once you start imposing a little bit of drought stress, which is kind of nice to do when you are managing fine turf grass, it's nice to keep the surfaces dry because that makes for a nice sporting surface. Uh, then what you find is manila grass can compete better with seashore paspalum when it gets a little bit dry in, in those kind of areas. And then the next picture is from a bent poa putting green on the Sunshine Coast of Canada. I visited Jason Haynes at Sunshine Coast Golf and Country Club in uh, the springtime. Actually, this was still late, late winter. And that's about the worst time of year there for what for grass conditions because it's gone through a autumn period and a winter period with very short day lengths, plenty of cloud cover, rain, snow, frost, and lots of microdochium pressure, lots of disease pressure. And yet I, I found those greens to be relatively disease free. And I was really surprised at how good the conditions were. Uh, I always like to see, you know, when I hear people talking about what kind of surfaces they produce, I like to see it for myself. And I was so glad that I got to go see those type of surfaces that Jason was producing in British Columbia. That was in early March. Also in March, I had a chance to go to Japan and I went to Inasa Golf Club in Shizuoka and I was there when all of the flowers were blooming, uh, the cherry blossom. So you've got your planted cherry blo cherry trees, uh, the domesticated cherry trees, and then you also have the wild cherry trees growing in the mountains, the Yamazakura. And it's just a real pretty time of year to be in Japan, especially when the weather was sunny like it was this day because you have a lot of trees going into leaf. So you've got various shades of green and gold and yellow as the leaves come out on the deciduous trees. And then you have the the cherry blossoms blooming. So that was quite pretty. But what I noticed at that golf course was just how, or I mean, what I, what I learned there was something that I've learned over time. I had a couple of blog posts about it last year about how I've found out that we can grow really good creeping bent grass, really high quality creeping bent grass with a lot lower N than I ever used to think possible. A lot lower nitrogen rates than I ever used to think possible. And when I visited this particular golf course on that day, I talked to the greenkeeper and I asked him about the number of rounds and how much nitrogen had been applied in the previous year and how much had been how much nitrogen had been applied in January and February and March so far in 2023. And those numbers are pretty low compared to what I used to think was normal. So he told me that in 2022, in the previous year, they had received six grams of nitrogen per square meter. That's 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. That's 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. I used to think in that climate that you would need about three times that much. So this is one third of what I used to think was the the rate of N that you might need to apply to have good creeping bent grass in this type of climate. And at the time that I took that photo, that photo with the pretty 
cherry tree flowers, the, the uh, mountain sakura growing in the background or, or blooming in the background. This, this photo was taken at the very end of March. And in January, February, and March combined, so in all of the first three months of 2023, the greens had been fertilized with a little bit less than half a gram of nitrogen per thousand square feet, which is less than a tenth of a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So in the first three months of the year, while the course had seen 9,400 rounds of golf, 9,400 rounds of golf in the first three months of the year on a tenth of a pound of nitrogen or less than 0.5 grams, less than five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And that's when the grass is already growing quite slow because of the cold temperatures, because it's winter. So sometimes... I would have thought that we need to push the grass a little bit more, that we need to put more fertilizer. But I'm also coming to realize that grass, if if you're not beating it up too much with top dressing or verticutting, and you just, uh, now this is for golf, right? (laughs) We're not talking about football or other surfaces that that, uh, are just getting torn up with cleats. Um, But for golf, uh, it, I've been surprised at how little nitrogen you can put, how lo- how slow the grass can grow and still tolerate what seems like a relatively high amount of traffic. So from this blog post I wrote, I said, I've learned that grass can often produce a better surface than I would have expected and be tolerant of more foot traffic than I realized was possible with less end fertilizer than I thought was necessary. And I also said that I encourage measuring the amount of clippings to figure out how much you need the grass to grow. And I I will put in a plug here for measuring the clipping volume. I think the only way to really safely get down to, uh, you know, to cut the amount of nitrogen that I once thought was necessary, to cut that down to one third of what I would have recommended before, I think the safe way to do that is if you measure how much the grass is growing. Because if the grass starts growing too slow and you measure that, then you can realize you need to add a little bit of nitrogen. But so long as the grass is already growing at a rapid enough rate, you can continue cutting the N. So I don't really like to talk about low N or high N I would rather talk about the growth rate and talk about the growth rate being uh, higher than desired or the growth rate being slower than desired. So I think that's, that's something that just really stuck with me. And I noticed that at other places around the world, people are producing some really good turf with lower nitrogen rates than you find in the textbooks. And I, I don't want to just say, If somebody's using a certain nitrogen rate, I don't want you to think that you should use that nitrogen rate. But what you can do is figure out how much you want the grass to grow. And if you just adjust the grass growth based on on whether it's growing fast enough or too fast at your site, if you just adjust it and then you can adjust the nitrogen based on that, I think that is a really nice way to manage now in 2024 and going forward. I took a picture in Japan in July. I saw slime mold on a Zoysia fairway in Hyogo prefecture. And I think that that is uh, a reminder to keep your eyes open and a reminder that if it's hot and humid and you're not uh, mowing the turf, you can get some really cool, uh, really cool looking (laughs) diseases. Uh, Fortunately, the slime mold is not uh, not really causing permanent damage there. It's just a little bit unsightly, but that will mold right off and it will go away when it gets a little bit drier. And I guess, you know, one of my favorite pictures is one that I took of a bunch of soil samples drying. I collected soil samples from a number of golf courses 
uh, across Japan. I'd, I'd done this project in Thailand the previous year, and this year I did, or in 2023, I did uh, this project in Japan where I was looking at tissue tests, soil tests, uh, OM246, total organic material testing, uh, and also measured some performance data from these greens. So this is a lot of data that I have now on my computer, and it will be stuff that I have yet to write about, have yet to fully analyze. Well, uh, one of the interesting things about this project uh, is I'm continuing to check something that I have mentioned a few times, and I think maybe you've heard Chris Tritabaugh mention this a few times also, about single core nutrient sampling versus composite sampling. And as you know, when you're taking soil nutrient samples, the recommended way to do it and, and it's, it's not just like the recommended way, it's the standard day way, it's the instructions that are coming from universities in the United States. The, the instructions for collecting samples from turf grass sites is to take 12 or more subsamples from the areas being tested. So if you're testing green number one, you're supposed to take 12 or more samples from green number one, mix those all together, and then take a subsample out of that. That's, that's the standard recommendation. Um, and I've been checking what happens if we just do a single core. If we, if we just take uh, one core from that grain and make a soil test on that and make a fertilizer recommendation based on that. So it's, it's been really interesting to see what the variation is between the single core and the composite samples. And I've done a variation of this test uh, four or five different, different uh, projects. Uh, I, I've done this in four or five different experiments and it all comes out to the same result, which is that we can make the equivalent fertilizer recommendation by just taking a single core, which to me greatly simplifies soil testing because I got to take these samples that I showed in that picture. And when you're taking the composite samples, it takes a long time and you have a lot of holes all over the grain. But if you can just take one core and get the same type of fertilizer recommendation as if you're taking multiple samples, uh, not only do you save time, but you don't damage the grain so much. So that, uh, that is something that I'm going to try to work on this year and, and explain that even further. I had a chance to go to Sri Lanka in August, and I visited the Royal Colombo Golf Club where I've been uh, a number of times. I, I think my first visit there may have been in uh, 2010. I think I went there for the first time in 2010. And at that time, the green conditions were not very good. In fact, uh, the first time I went there, I had to make a recommendation to go on to temper temporary greens on on some of the holes the green conditions were that poor that they had to move on to temporary greens or or move on to a green that's cut in the fairway to to be specific uh, to allow the the grass on the greens to recover and now these greens are terrific uh, these are tiff eagle ultra dwarf bermuda grass greens and the course is maintained to a very high standard. And I think if, if you look at courses in, um, uh, in Southeast Asia and in the Indian subcontinent, uh, these greens rank right up there, at, at least on the last couple of times that I've been there. And, and from the pictures that I've seen in between, uh, my visits, I, I would say that these greens rank right up there with, uh, they're definitely in the top tier of ultra dwarf Bermuda grass greens in this part of the world. And I think that that is wonderful considering the, uh, 
the type of equipment that they have to work with there and the 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 level of improvement that's been seen on those greens since uh, 2010. Now there, uh, the golf course superintendent there who's in charge of the greens is named Chaminda and he's been to the Thai conference, the Thai superintendents conference uh, a number of times. He's been to a couple of the seminars that I gave in, in uh, India and he subscribes to the ATC uh, updates, uh, blog newsletter. So you can, you, uh, you can see in the show notes, there's a link to where you can sign up to get that, where you could get every blog post delivered by email. So he, he, uh, I know that he, he follows what I'm recommending and he follows what I'm doing. And it's just really awesome to see it work so well to see a place that didn't have a hundred percent grass cover and had greens that were rolling at, you know, six or seven feet on the stint meter to, to go to the point where they can now have a hundred percent grass cover and have greens that are rolling over 10 on the stint meter and, uh, rolling with a really nice bobble test score also with, with a really high quality roll. So, um, I, I really enjoy seeing those type of results. I went to Kea Golf Club in Japan a number of times. So I, I showed here another picture uh, or another picture from Japan. This one's from Kea Golf Club. And Kea Golf Club this year did the most number of rounds that they've done uh, since the bubble time. So the, the bubble in Japan, you may have heard uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with Japanese golf, but you've heard a little bit about it. One of the things that you may have heard is that Golf in Japan is extremely expensive. Yeah, and you may have heard that it's impossible to get a tea time in Japan. And you may have heard that it's cheaper for Japanese golfers to travel outside of Japan to play golf than it is to play golf in Japan, both because they can't get a tea time and because golf is so expensive in Japan. That is not true. That might have been true in the late 1980s and in the early 1990s, and that was the time of the Japanese economic bubble, the, the real estate bubble, and also the golf bubble when there was a huge demand for golf and there were a huge number of golf courses being built at that time. So if, if you look at Japanese golf courses and you look at the number of tee times that, or, or the number of rounds that were played, that all of the records as far as I know, are back from that period. But the, then there was quite a decline in golf over the next 25 or 30 years. But for courses that are well-managed in a good location with good uh, playing conditions, there is quite a demand for golf. And at Kea Golf Club, they had multiple professional tournaments in 2023, they had the Japan Mid Amateur Championship, which I was back for in November last year. And this course uh, is all Zoysia. It's Zoysia on the tees, Zoysia in the rough, Zoysia on the fairways, and Zoysia on the greens. It's very common in Japan to have Zoysia almost everywhere. But at high level courses like this, it's not so common to have Zoysia on the greens. Because Zoysia is not such a brilliant grass. The quality of the ball roll on Zoysia in the summer is average. It's uh, <laughs> You have to do a lot of work. You have to do a lot of work to get a, uh, a decent ball roll when the grass is growing in the summer. Now, in the winter time when the grass is dormant when the zoysia is not growing you can actually get quite a nice roll on the zoysia but uh, most courses in japan find that the, they prefer to grow bent grass because throughout the year they are happier have it presenting bent grass as a putting surface to the golfers so at this golf course near fukuoka or in Fukuoka prefecture near the, the city of Fukuoka, they did 
almost 50,000 rounds. Maybe they just hit 50,000 rounds in 2023. And that's the most rounds that they've done in many, many years. And it's interesting to me to think about this is all Zoysia. The grass is basically not growing from November to March or November to April. So it's, it's dormant for four, five, six months of the year. And it's still open during that time. It's still getting divots taken. And yet the grass can be in such good condition. So it's, it's nice to see how good these surfaces can be when the grass is dormant for, uh, let's say, let's say you've got 20, 25,000 rounds are played on the grass when it's basically not growing. So uh, I, I, I think that's cool, and I, I always like to see how few divots there are on the tees during the summer. I also got to see the amazing spouter sprayer. Uh, I was in Hiroshima in, this was in late September, and if you haven't seen the spouter sprayer, uh, I suggest you check it out. I've got a video about that on my YouTube channel, and this is a... Uh, a really cool way to spray trees and to rapidly spray uh, rough and fairways. And you can cover an entire hole in five minutes, 10 minutes. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty fast. So when I shared this, uh, it also reminded me, I mean, it, it didn't terribly surprise me, but there is some response from people in the turf industry who sort of throw, uh, how, how to phrase it, uh, they seem not pleased with me that I'm sharing this. And, and they say, well, that's not a good look. That's not a good look for our industry. Uh, maybe we shouldn't show a sprayer that, that is putting out so much material. Uh, and that, that person is, doesn't seem to be wearing uh, proper protective equipment. And, uh, and they're just like kind of a negative reaction and, and people don't really seem to like to see that. Uh, but I, I guess I, I, I kind of understand that, but uh, I, I have a different reaction. And that is, as far as I know, in the country that this sprayer is being operated, it's legal. And as far as I know, that operator is wearing the proper protective equipment as required in that country. And I think in that country, for those types of grasses, if you don't apply fungicides, and if you don't apply herbicides, and if you don't apply insecticides, you are not going to have the type of grass conditions that people are accustomed to in in that country with those grass types. So um, I don't I I don't really like applying pesticides, uh, and I, I would rather that we don't have to apply pesticides to turf. However, I also don't want to pretend that the surfaces that get produced at many places around the world are not treated with a lot of fungicides to make that surface disease free. And I don't want to pretend that the surfaces are not treated with insecticides to keep, uh, to keep armyworms from, <laughs> from turning it from green to brown. And I don't, I don't want to pretend that the weed-free surfaces on dormant zoysia in the winter just happen by accident and that those are not uh, happening because of pre-emergent herbicides. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be honest about what we really do to produce uh, good turf in, in, uh, in this industry. So uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I had a chance to see that sprayer and I'm glad I had a chance to share a little bit about that. Uh, on that same trip to Hiroshima, I, I actually stayed there for a couple weeks uh, from from late September into early October, and I had a chance to go see the Atomic Bomb Dome, which is, uh, I think it's part of what's called the Peace Memorial Park, 
in the central part of Hiroshima. And this was a, uh, a, it's now called the atomic bomb dome. It's a structure right near the hypocenter. So the bomb, uh, the bomb that was detonated, it was dropped by an airplane and, and the target point was a, a bridge that is on a river that's right by this building. And uh, it exploded in the air above that bridge. And of course, it, uh, it flattened most of the buildings around that area. And it, um, it, it created a lot of fire. And, uh, and almost everything was destroyed around that area, except for this building somehow. And, and with its dome structure, uh, it still remained intact. So that's quite an iconic building, and uh, it's quite a moving place to visit. Um, and you just think about all of the destruction, all of the lives lost um, from from the from the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. But one thing that I noticed was a surprising grass on the lawn. Uh, it's centipede grass, and centipede grass is not so common in Japan, but as you get into Western Japan, you start to see it in a few areas. In Japan, the grasses that are common for for areas near sea level like Hiroshima, the grasses that are common are uh, Korai, which is Oisha Matrella, Manila grass, and the other grass that's common in Japan is called Noshiba, and that is Oisha Japonica, or Japanese long grass. Those are the grasses that are really common. And so to see uh, a lawn of centipede grass like that um, and, and uh, in such fine condition, uh, it, it certainly struck, struck me. Uh, and I, I guess also on a botanical note in, in this uh, area, if you ever do go to Hiroshima, there are trees that survived uh, the atomic bomb blast. And I, I, I don't think these trees did. I, I, I can't speak for them. I don't know. But uh, um, nearby is the Hiroshima Castle. And at Hiroshima Castle, there were a couple of trees that were labeled uh, as atomic bomb trees or something like that. And those trees actually survived the the blast. And so it, it's, it's quite uh, interesting as a... A uh, person with a uh, horticultural degrees and somebody who who uh, enjoys taking botanical walks uh, to to go around uh, and and s- and see trees and see signs on the trees and say uh, this this tree of this species uh, was alive and then it survived. I mean, it it was already a living tree at the time of of uh, the explosion. So that, that was interesting. Uh, I, I then went to an island in the far south of Japan, and I saw something interesting in a bicycle parking lot. In the bicycle parking lot, where it's on a beach island, uh, there are not so many motorized vehicles on the island, uh, and it's a great place to rent bicycles and ride around. And I rented a bicycle and I rode to a beach, one of the most beautiful beaches in Japan. It's called Kondoi Beach. This is on Takitomi Island in the Yayama group of islands in Okinawa. It's actually pretty close to Taiwan. And there is a lot of zoysia growing there, a lot of fine bladed zoysia, zoysia matrella, um, maybe... uh, Zoysia, Zoysia Pacifica also, fine-bladed zoysia. And in the parking lot, I saw some of the zoysia. So, so this is an area that's trampled by foot traffic and it's trampled by bicycle traffic and it's on sand. So it's, uh, it's zoysia grass growing on sand, something like you might imagine that you'd have if there were a link style golf course built on sand dunes on, on that kind of island. There is most of the zoysia is just normal, and then some of it is really dark green, and and those dark green bits go in lines, and what those lines are are little sunken depressions 
where ants have traveled. So ant paths sometimes will travel through this type of sandy soil and it moves the the sand somehow or the ants, uh, perhaps they pick up some of the sand grains. I, I don't know, but it, it, it lowers the, the ground level and it lowers the ground level just enough that more leaf area is exposed. And when more leaf area or, or not exposed, uh, there just more leaf area is present. And if you have more leaf area present, then it looks greener. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the grass is healthier, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the ant paths are a desirable thing. It's just a phenomenon that happens when you happen to have more green leaf area in one area versus where you don't have a green leaf area. This, of course, has some relation to cultivation, specifically core cultivation or solid tying cultivation on golf course putting greens, where sometimes the area where the hole was put into the green has a darker green coloration, and it also is slightly depressed below the other ground area. And because of that, it has a little bit more green leaf area. And People will sometimes say, if I ever suggest that maybe you don't need to do venting or maybe you don't need to do core cultivation, one of the arguments that is occasionally put back to me is people will share a picture showing that the grass is greener in the aeration holes. And then they will say, see, I told you so. This works great. I'm going to keep doing it see how much better the grass is where I aerified. And I think that could be, they, they could be correct. It could be that the grass is so much better, or it could be that there's just a little bit more leaf area showing. And if there's a little bit more leaf area present, because the ground is slightly depressed in those holes, then uh, that explains the phenomenon. And it's not so much that the cultivation made the grass any better. It's just a visual thing. And of course, you see that very well in these ant trails in Manila grass at Condoy Beach uh, at, at the bicycle parking lot. I then, uh, shortly thereafter, I was in France and uh, in the western part of Paris, uh, there is a golf course, Golf de Saint Cloud or Saint Clou. Uh, I, I pardon, <laughs> excuse me for, for uh, not pronouncing it perfectly, but it's uh, a beautiful 36-hole facility that looks down over the city of Paris, and you can see the Eiffel Tower in the background. And on these greens, it's mostly Poa annua, which is a common grass for that type of climate. And I... I found the grass conditions to and, and, and the trees that are growing, it really ri reminded me a lot of Oregon, where I grew up in, in the western part of Oregon. Um, I can see some Deodore cedars and some other uh, grasses and trees that are quite similar to the species that I grew up with. So that is, uh, it, it's really typical. And I know that with typical turf grass management, you tend to get poa annua in that type of climate. But the next picture, the next place I visited uh, is surprising in a way uh, because that was in Denmark. Uh, I, I went on the tour de fungus for the second year in a row and we visited, I think, seven golf courses in one day around the Copenhagen area. And this is actually a little bit colder, uh, a little bit farther north than Paris. This is in Denmark, in Copenhagen, or in the Copenhagen region. Uh, so this would be something like going from Portland, Oregon, and going well up into British Columbia. And when you do that, when you go that far north, I, I still kind of expect to see Poa annua, and I still expect 
I still expect to see that kind of surface. So it is surprising for me. And it was surprising again this year. I went on the 2022 Tour de Fungus and I went on the 2023 Tour de Fungus. It's surprising to me to see so little disease on the greens and to see the greens so... At, I mean, the, the species that's so conspicuously absent is Poa annua. Instead, the greens are primarily fine fescue and various types of agrostis, various types of bent grass. And I would have thought that you can't do it, that, that in this type of climate where it's that cool and you have golfer traffic and you have winter and uh, you, you mow the grass relatively short, that eventually the POA annual will just invade. These A lot of these courses are not treated with any herbicides. They're not treated with any fungicides. They're not treated with any pesticides whatsoever. And to be able to manage greens relatively free of POA annua without pesticides in that kind of climate is, uh, it's, it's surprising. It's, uh, it's a nice surprise and it's something that I enjoy seeing. Uh, and it's one of the, one of the things that, uh, also makes me think it's, it's more possible than people give, uh, it, 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 I think it's more possible than people think. So just like I mentioned the lower nitrogen rates, I mentioned earlier that I saw that golf course in Japan and checked about the uh, the actual nitrogen rates that were applied. And those nitrogen rates were 33% of what I once would have thought necessary. Well, I've learned that you can get a lot better grass than I once thought possible with um, lower nitrogen rates, lower growth rates than I, than I thought were required. And I've also learned that you actually can, with interceding, with careful management, at least in the climate around Copenhagen, you can manage some pretty nice putting surfaces, keep them relatively free of POA, and keep disease at the peak time of the year when you would be expecting to see quite a bit of... Um, of pink snow mold or microndochium patch. You can keep them relatively free of that without pesticides too. So it's, uh, it's things, it's things that I once thought were not so possible to now, now I think that they are possible. And then I think maybe this can be applied in other places also. And the last picture I picked for the year was from the Australian golf club, the conditions there were just superb. I had a chance to volunteer and, and work at the Australian Open Golf Championship in late November and early December. And those greens are creeping bent grass. Fairways are uh, Santa Ana green cooch or Bermuda grass. And those surfaces were just superb. So what I learned there is doing everything right, paying attention to detail, doing everything right, putting the right products at the right time, putting the right amount of work, doing the right work at the right time, despite challenging weather in the time leading up to the tournament. And uh, uh, for quite a long time, last year, or 2022, there were a lot of floods in this uh, part of Australia. That uh, heavy precipitation continued into 2023. There was there were just a lot of flooding uh, and other challenges. And to see those surfaces in such excellent condition, uh, I was I was really impressed. So if you uh, if you've seen, I, I have a video about this, and that was about the volunteer experience at the tournament. If you're interested, check that out. It will show some more of the excellent photos. Maybe I'm even going to share some more about this coming up because it was just uh, a treat to get to experience Australian greenkeeping firsthand and to work with so many Australian greenkeepers. I guess the other thing, I mean, uh, this isn't entirely new to me, 
that this is done with so few staff. Um, but we showed up, all the volunteers showed up the weekend before the tournament and the course was already in excellent condition. And this is done with like a regular crew of like 22 people or something like that. And that is, it, it's fewer people than I think it would take to create such a high standard of appearance and high standard of playing surface at a course in the United States. So uh, Australian greenkeepers and the greenkeeping teams are, are really skilled and, and there's something about the way they do the work or the efficiency of the work, um, that, that allows, uh, greenkeepers in Australia to produce some really excellent surfaces and they're renowned around the world for producing excellent playing surfaces. So that's something that I consider myself very lucky to have a, had a chance to go there and experience it firsthand during the tournament. And uh, hopefully I'll continue to learn and, and uh, we can find some of the best, uh, the best practices that greenkeepers around the world are using and, uh, and share those so that people everywhere can take advantage of them. I know Australia is not the only place that produces really good surfaces sometimes with, uh, with fewer people than it might take in other parts of the world. Um, I know that the year before in 2022, I went to New Zealand and in New Zealand, the average number of greenkeepers on a golf course is quite low. And I know there's a lot of courses producing really, really good surfaces with two, three, four, five, six greenkeepers, uh, on the entire crew. So that is, uh, that's something that I, I think maybe the mi relatively mild temperatures have something to do with it. Uh, if, if you would ask me to speculate and, and just guess, it's not that those climates are easy because they do have a lot of extremes. Uh, you can listen to my episode earlier where I talked with Fraser Brown from Lake Karanup Golf Club, Lake Karanup Country Club in uh, Western Australia in Perth. And we talked about the extreme temperature conditions that are experienced there. Um, and when you have those type of uh, temperatures, it's not that the climate is easy. But if you look on average, the temperatures are relatively mild in a place like Sydney. And so if you go to a place like Sydney or a place like Auckland in, in New Zealand, the temperatures are relatively mild. And because of that, if you're growing warm season grasses, they're not going to grow very much because the growth potential will not be high enough. That There's just not enough heat for the warm season grasses to grow, uh, grow fast enough to, to need to be mowed so much. So uh, maybe that's, that's something that, that allows the work to be done efficiently because maybe there's just a little bit less mowing time that needs to be executed on those properties in order to produce those types of surfaces. All right. So there is the, uh, there is the blog post finished. I'm going to put a direct link to that in the show notes so that you can have a look at those if you were just listening to this. And I hope that I've, able, I've been able to give a description about the things that I learned or the things that were really a highlight for me this year, or sorry, in 2023, that I was reminded of as I saw those photos. So I thank you for listening and I will sign off now for ATC from Trong, Thailand. I'm Michael Woods. Bye-bye.